uh, 3 to 5, but also there is that review session happening from 5 to 6.30 in Cockins Hall, room two th 232, which is a uh, classroom there in Cockins Hall. If you've ever been to the tutor room or my office, that's Cockins Hall, so find the second floor there. Um, just a quick show of hands, and I don't, I don't care yes or no, but uh, how many of you think will come to the review session tonight? Okay. Classroom holds about 40, so I wanted to get a bigger space if I needed, but I think we should be okay. Um, so just a reminder, you are welcome to bring a formula sheet to the exam. So 8 and a half by 11, regular size sheet of paper, front and back is fine. Um, <clears throat> again, calculators are, are certainly allowed. Please know if you have a calculator on your phone, that's not okay. Um, and I'll make a note on the exam. If you're, you're welcome to use a calculator, but if you do, please write out your steps so I can kind of uh, see what you did and give you partial credit if that, if that needs to be done. Um, so just please be very clear with how you're using your calculator if you choose to use it on the exam. Uh, any other questions, comments about the exam? Yes. The binary table. And yes, I will provide you with tables for whatever, and any table that you need, I will, I will provide for you. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> All good otherwise? Okay, we're going to uh, resume and probably finish up chapter, chapter 4 today. Again, uh, finishing up our, the chapter here on continuous random variables. Um, so at the end of class on Friday, we introduced uh, the gamma distribution. Um, so this is the last class of distributions that we'll look at in this chapter. Um, again, it was used to... So again, x x has to be positive. So it's we're modeling. Uh, it's a probability distribution for positive quantities. We talked about um, things like uh, lifetime of a light bulb or um, rainfall or something else like that. That's that can only be positive is kind of what the quantities we'll be looking at here in this in this section. Um, and again, we we uh, we looked at a few definitions, but here here's kind of a, our usual thing. We're stepping through what the what's the PDF. What's the, what are some properties of that distribution? What's the CDF? Um, so the first thing here is a, um, the PDF. So here's the form of the PDF again. It depends on two parameters, alpha and beta. And uh, again, kind of has a scary looking form, uh, which we, you don't need to worry about too much. Um, and then our notation is just going to be x is distributed as a gamma random variable with uh, parameters alpha and beta. And did I leave these? Yeah, so here, here's just some pictures of what, of what these distributions could look like. And I think we talked briefly about what um, alpha and beta each sort of represent. It's not, um, it's not the usual parameters that we've seen before, but uh, they control the, kind of the shape and how, how stretched out, how squished in these distributions are. Um, so there's just a few examples to look at. Um, and so kind of thinking about what are, the, what are the properties of this distribution, kind of what are the key things to know. Again, the, the mean and variance are always things that we're going to be concerned about. <clears throat> and I won't actually go through doing these calculations. Um, you could. It obviously can be done. But the, the mean of a <clears throat> gamma random variable is, is alpha times beta. And the variance is alpha times beta squared. So again, these are <clears throat> good facts to start memorizing. Don't have to memorize them quite yet since it's not on the exam. but. Uh, that's something for the future. You get good at memorizing these things. Save yourself a little time. Okay, so that's the that's the PDF. There's the some properties uh, of the distribution. And then the the CDF is is just the usual thing. Again, this is just the um, the probability that x is less than or equal to little x. So it's just the CDF pro uh, the pro probability of being less than or equal to whatever value we're looking at here. And so this thing here is the, this thing is the PDF in the in the special case where where beta equals one. So for now, assuming that beta equals one, the CDF looks like this, uh, and that's called the incomplete gamma function. I'm not the biggest fan of the notation. They use a capital F for this, which is the same as any other CDF. So I'll try to be clear about the notation there. But um, and again, you're not we're not going to ask you to calculate this thing in closed form. That's not going to be a very fun thing to do by hand. Uh, so again, we're going to be using a table to, to, to find probabilities involving this thing. And um, I'm not sure about your calculator. I'm not sure if your calculator can do gamma, gamma distribution. Um, it can do some, some variations of that, but, but I'm not sure about this. But anyway, we can, we can use the table. 
Um, so this is for when beta equals one, when for a sort of generic alpha beta for our gamma distribution, um, our, our CDF again is just going to be that incomplete gamma function. We're going to divide x by whatever beta is, and then alpha is whatever whatever alpha is. And so um, we can we can still use the table for any value of beta, even though that uh, formula on the previous page was just for beta equals one. Okay, so let's uh, let's do an example here. Show how to how we can apply this thing. Oh, before we do that, I guess I'll just show you show you the table here. And this this is in um, it's at the bottom of page eighteen on your chapter four notes, uh, and it's also in the back of your textbook, obviously. So for example, here again, uh, remember we're doing a distribution for positive uh, th quantities that can only be positive. Um, so let's talk about the um, lifetime of a, of a transistor of a certain type. So um, when it's subjected to a test, we can say that this thing has a gamma distribution with mean 24 weeks and standard deviation uh, 12 weeks. Um, so we're saying that x is a gamma distribution. What are the, what are the parameters of this thing? Um, so the mean, so x is distributed as a gamma random variable. And we'll fill in the quantities in a minute. So the, we're told that the expected value of x um, is 24 weeks, um, and we know we know that the mean of x is uh, alpha times beta. It's alpha times beta, and we also are told here that the standard deviation is 12 weeks. So that means the variance is 12 squared weeks. So the variance of x equals um, 12 squared, or 144, and that's equal to alpha times beta squared. Uh, so two equations, two unknowns, where we can figure out what each of these things are. Therefore, um, alpha equals 4, and beta equals 6. So therefore, x is a gamma distribution with alpha 4 and beta equal to 6. So um, again, kind of as, as we have seen before, it's often easiest to kind of tell, tell you what the mean and, and standard deviation of variance are. And so here we just have to do a little, a little extra step of solving to figure out what exactly our parameters are here. OK. So in any case, what's the probability that a transistor will last between 12 and 24 weeks? Um, so the usual picture here, if here's, our, if here's our PDF, maybe it looks something like this. Um, here's the PDF. Uh, we just want the probability that it lasts between uh, 12 and 24 weeks. So again, we're still talking about area under the curve. That's, that's what we wanted, the usual thing here. Um, so yeah, we want the probability that x is between 12 and 24. <coughs> and again, uh, our, sort of the usual strategy is we can separate this out into two, two quantities. x is less than or equal to 24 minus probability that x is less than or equal to 12. Uh, and then to actually calculate these things, let me jump back quickly to this slide. Um, we're going to use we're going to use this this identity here. So the probability that x is less than some value is equal to the incomplete gamma function of that value divided by beta, and then the parameter alpha. So we can use that here. Uh, so this is incomplete gamma function at 24 divided by beta, which is six, and then alpha is four. Same for this other point, um, 12 divided by 6, and then alpha is 4. So this is beta, and this is alpha.
Okay, so now we can now we can flip over the table and uh, use the table to figure out what our probabilities that we would like here are. Okay, so remember this table gives us the incomplete gamma function for various values of alpha. So here alpha equals four, so we can pick out uh, the four column. And, and the two values that we're interested in here, I guess, let me just write this down. This is 24 divided by 6, so that's 4 and 4 minus f of 2 and 4. So we want to pick out the 4 row and the 2 row. So again, kind of same, same way of using the table. We're looking for a particular column based on what our alpha is, and then we just have to find the value of x that corresponds to what we're looking for. Uh, so what we have here, this is uh, 0.567 um, minus 0.143, which is uh, 0.424. So chance that the transistor, transistor lasts between 12 and 24 weeks, pre pretty good chance of that, 42%. Um, Okay. Uh, another practice here. What's the probability that this thing will last at most 24 weeks? And then we'll ask a question about the median. So, probability that it will last at most 24 weeks. What uh, what inequality do I want there in my in my probability? Probably that x is, is what less than or equal to 24. Nicely done. So again, this is just the uh, incomplete gamma function of the x value we're interested in. So 24 divided by beta. So this is the same thing that we saw before, which is just the 0.567. All right, so that's Pulling that off, the same same number that we we're looking at is on the previous previous uh, part of this this example. So then, is the median uh, less than 24? And why or why not? You need to remember what the median is. So what, what's what's the median? Yeah. So the median is the 50th percentile, right? It's the uh, kind of like the number that's right at, right in the middle. Think about the median strip if you're driving down the highway. It's kind of like kind of like that, the number that's right in the middle. So 50th percentile, 50% of the area is below the median, 50% of the area is above the median. Um, so what so, so is is the median less than less than 24? Yeah. So 24 here is the 56th, 57th percentile, something like that. So the median is going to be less, going to be less than that. Uh, so because Because more than 50% or 0.5 um, probability is below 24, the median will be a less than 24. Okay, and that will actually be that will actually always be true for well, um, sorry. What I should say is, so these these distributions are are kind of are right skewed, right? So we we haven't we haven't talked. That was chapter one material that we didn't really talk about in this class. But um, so far, what we've seen it's a really terrible picture. <laughs> so far, we we have seen the normal distribution, which was symmetric, right? Uh, kind of the mean was right right in the middle. Um, then on either side, it looked exactly the same. Um, so the, kind of the other thing, the other thing that a distribution like this can look like is it can be skewed, and it can be skewed either left or right. Um, all of the gamma distributions that, that look like this, again, you can think back to that picture that we saw. Maybe let me flip back there. It's better than my drawing. Are all right skewed? Um, so kind of they trail off to the right. So there's kind of a cluster of values off to the left, and then they trail off to the right. And so the median will always be, so, so what I didn't call out was that the mean there again was 24. 
So the median is always going to be larger. Sorry, the mean is always going to be larger than the median um, in these in these distributions. Um, so that is that can be we can make that statement in general. So the median is always less than the mean for for a gamma distribution. So um, think about the the mean again is our balancing point. So the balancing point is always going to be kind of further out there than than where the median is is sitting. And if you, again, we're not going to be looking at any of those, but if you have a left skewed distribution that's skewed in the other direction, then the, the opposite is true. Again, that's just a, just a little fact. <clears throat> okay, a few more questions here for, uh, for this problem. So what is the, so that was the, the mean we saw as the 57th percentile there about. What is the 99th percentile of the lifetime of this distribution? Um, so now we have our, we're told the percentile and we want to figure out what value of, of x that corresponds to. So um, so what do we want here? We want, we want to find x such that um, 0.99 is equal to the, the CDF of that value, right? So the, we can use the incomplete gamma function of x divided by beta. And... Uh, then alpha again is still four. So to do this, we can flip over to our table again. Remember, we want the alpha equals to four column, and so you can scan down this list, and sure enough, here's the 99th percentile. So what does that correspond to? That corresponds to 10. Oops. Um, so. The table tells us that 0.99 is equal to um, f of 10 and 4. And so if we want x over 6 to be equal to 10, then uh, of course x equals 60. So the 60th week is our 99th percentile here of this of this thing. Is this making sense? Uh, are you guys all with me? Okay, great. <clears throat> and then we'll do another one more question, sort of like that one. So suppose that the test, kind of thinking about it in different terms. Suppose that so we're doing a test for this this transistor, right? But and suppose that it will actually be terminated after some some amount of weeks. Um, so of course, if you're doing a lifetime test, you can't you can't run it forever. Eventually, you have to stop. Um, so what what how many weeks do we have to let this thing run such that only 0.5% um, of all tr transistors will still be operating uh, when I when I end that when I end that test? So it's very similar to the previous problem. How do how do I want to set this up? What am I looking for here? Yes, right. So I'm looking for uh, the 99.5 percent uh, percentile here, exactly. So kind of the same thing. I want to figure out what value of my CDF will give me um, will give me this this uh, pr probability. So this is I want to find a value of x such that x over six and four again. So we can look back at our table. Still alpha equals four. Scan down, and again, here we have there's our nicely rounded off 99.5th percentile, and that's at 11. So again, this is, uh, so that means that, that when uh, x equals 11, then we have this, this property. But again, x over 6 equals 11, so So we need we need to let this thing run for 66 weeks before we can be sure that only 
0.5% of those things will still be operating. Is that okay with everybody? What's going on here? So, um, so I guess this is actually, so T equals 66, 66 weeks. <coughs> Questions or comments on the example here? Okay. So that is the, that's all we'll say about the gamma distribution officially for now. Um, although next we're going to look at two special cases of the gamma distribution. So still sort of talking about it, I guess. The first one is called the, the exponential distribution. Um, so this is kind of a, the mo one of the most commonly gamma distributions that we'll use. And, and it's, uh, the PDF looks different, but if you set alpha equals to 1 and introduce a, a different parameter, lambda, and make that equal to 1 over, um, set beta equal to 1 over lambda, then you'll, you'll, get, you'll get this simplification. So um, we're going to say x has an exponential distribution if, uh, with parameter lambda if the PDF looks, looks like that. So again, we're still, we're still looking at only positive, um, can only be, only be greater than or equal to 0, um, and our notation will just be the exp, and I'll, I'll usually actually use a capital capital E to s distinguish that from the exponent. <laughs> um, yeah, and so again, again, these are the exponential distribution is is, is just a, a form of the gamma distribution, so it's going to be used to kind of model the same types of things, um, but it's it's simpler in form than than what the gamma distribution looks like. So some, some pictures here, this is not in your notes, I guess, but this is what the, the, the exponential distribution looks like. Again, if you remember back to when we said when beta is less than or equal to 1, this thing is always, um, always decreasing. So it's, there's, no, there's no little bump, and then it goes down like we saw before. It's um, largest when you're at 0, and then it decays from there. And then uh, you can see as, as lambda gets smaller, the thing gets more spread out. So... Um, Lambda getting smaller means beta is getting bigger, right? So that means it's more, more spread out, kind of same idea as before. So the intuition from before all, all still holds here, um, but there's just a picture of what these things, what these things look like. Okay, so uh, for a, so that was our PDF. Next, we want to talk about the expected value and variance. Um, so when we have a, a exponential random variable, the mean is 1 over lambda, and the variance is 1 over lambda squared. Um, so remember, remember this is just a gamma distribution. So if, if x is exponential uh, lambda, that's the same as saying x is distributed as a gamma with alpha equal to 1 and beta equal to 1 over lambda. So again, remember our the mean of a gamma was alpha times beta, so that's 1 over lambda. Uh, and the variance is alpha times beta squared, so that gives you exactly what you would expect it to be. And so we have this kind of interesting property that um, both the mean and the standard deviation of, of an exponential are the same thing. Um, and so here we are actually going to quickly walk through this calculation just to show you how, again, remind you how this can be done. And uh, we're going to need some calculus knowledge here. We're going to use integration by parts. Um, so let's see about how we can actually double check that this is what our what the expected value of this thing is. Okay, so again, the expected value of x. Again, by definition, this is integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of the uh, PDF. So f of x. Now we have a lambda in there. I'm um, sorry. Times let's throw an x in there. <laughs> Um, but of course, here x can only be positive, so we can write this. This is actually from 0 to infinity of x times, um, then the PDF here is lambda times e to the negative lambda x dx. Okay, so that's just by definition. We're just writing out what this, what this thing is. That's, that's how we find what the expected value is. <clears throat> And now we want to use, again, um, I don't know, probably the only way to do this is to use integration by parts. Um, so let's set 
um, I don't know if you, how you guys did this, but let's let um, let's let u equal to x and dv equal the other part of this, so lambda times e to the negative lambda x. So that's what we're we're going to use this going to use this thing here. So remember, when you have the integral, you can you can split it up into two parts: um, some function u times a derivative, and then you can um, flip those things around there. <clears throat> so again, if if u equals x and dv equals uh, lambda times e to the negative lambda x, then uh, du is just one, and uh, Again, v is going to be the, the integral of lambda times e to the negative lambda x. Um, so v will equal negative e to the negative lambda x. And that's just finding a v such that the derivative is equal to um, what we wanted it to be up there. So it's integration by parts somewhere there in the cobwebs of your brain. <laughs> it's not something we use very often. Or maybe it is. <clears throat> okay, so once we have the, the substitution set up like this, we can um, use the identity on the previous page. So this is uh, u times v, so negative x times e to the negative lambda x um, plus v du. So now we have the integral from 0 to infinity of uh, v, so um, negative e to the negative lambda x times um, du. So nobody called me out on this. This is actually du is equal to dx. Or, or du, you can write that instead. Um, so we just have a dx in here. Minus the integral, so yeah. Is that what you mean? No. It's a minus. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you. <laughs> yes, right. That's what. That's what this thing says. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> yep. And again, of course. Sorry, I'm leaving a few things out of here. Of course, we want to evaluate this thing, this first part, at zero and in infinity. <clears throat> okay. I think we should be all set now. So uh, let's first evaluate this this first thing at zero infinity. Um, if we have so this is um, minus x over e to the lambda x. Evaluate zero infinity. Um, so we'll skip over why that is. We'll, don't spend too much time on this. But um, again, when x equals zero, that thing equals zero. When x equals infinity, um, you have a L'Hopital's type situation going on there. So, um, but you can show that that also equals zero. The denominator will dominate that term, so that thing will go go away. And then we want to add on this integral here of e to the negative lambda x dx. So let's say this thing equals 0. I'll let you double check that one. And then now, now we're in a familiar integral that we can, we know what that is. So this is just uh, negative 1 over lambda um, times e to the negative lambda x evaluated at 0 and infinity. So again, e to the negative infinity is 0, and e to the negative 0 is 1. So this is going to give us um, negative 0 plus 1 over lambda, or 1 over lambda.
Questions or comments? So we're not, we're not going to do it again for the variance, but you could do a very similar trick. Um, you have to take it an extra step further, but uh, we, could, we could find use the same thing to find the expected value of x squared, and then use that to find the variance. So I'm going to forego doing that for now. But you could, you could indeed do the same thing. All right. So that's the, uh, that was the PDF and the expected value and variance. Last thing to talk about is the uh, CDF. So the nice thing about the exponential distribution is that we have a nice closed form CDF. So we're back in kind of a familiar situation. Again, this is just the, the integral from 0 up to x times the, uh, of the PDF. So um, lambda times e to the negative lambda. Let's use y in there. Um, again, we can write down exactly what that is. It's when x is bigger than 0, it's 1 minus e to the negative lambda, lambda x. Um, so no more, no more using the table here, which is, which is nice. L let me actually just write, write this out real quick. So, um, so this thing is equal to, um, this integral here is equal to negative e, um, similar thing as we did before to the negative lambda y evaluated at 0 and x. And so we have uh, negative e to the negative lambda x um, plus, plus 1. So 1 minus e to the negative lambda x is what that, what that integral equals. Okay, we all we all good on the calculations here. So that's our PDF. Talked about the expected value and variance, and then here's our CDF, and no more table for the exponential distribution. All right, let's do a let's do an example here. Uh, so apparently, the data collected at the Toronto airport suggests that an exponential distribution is a good thing to uh, is a good model for the duration of rainfall. So we're talking about how long it's going to rain. Can approximate that thing pretty well with a exponential distribution that has mean 2.725 hours. Um, so again, if x is an exponential distribution, if x has an exponential distribution. Um, what we're what we're told here is that the mean of x is 2.725, and we know that equals one over lambda. So figuring out what our parameters here, kind of like the last example we did, um, this means that lambda is equal to um, 0.367, one over one over 2.725. So um, if the mean is 2.725, then our then our parameter is is 0.367. So that's so x has an exponential distribution with lambda equal to 0.367 can answer some similar types of questions here. Um, what is the probability that the duration of a rainfall event is at least two hours? So again, the probability of, of x is what? Is at least two hours? Greater than or equal to, thank you. <clears throat> so you can take your favorite way of calculating that if you want to practice doing an integral. Again, this is uh, probably from 2 up to infinity. That's how you could calculate that thing directly. Or we can use the calculations that we've already done. This is just 1 minus the probability that x is less than, x is less than, more or less than or equal to 2. If we write it like that, then of course we can use, use the CDF here. So remember our CDF, uh, this is just 1 minus um, 1 minus e to the negative lambda x, so um, 0.367 times x here, which is 2. And sure enough, that is um, point, 
So just plugging in <clears throat> lambda and x into that formula for the CDF that we saw on the previous page. Is that okay with everybody what I just threw around there? Okay, so that's probably that it will last at least two hours. Uh, we can ask a question like we've seen before, what's the probability that the rainfall duration will exceed the mean value by no more, by, by more than uh, two standard deviations? So now we want to see that's the probability that um, x exceeds the mean mean value by more than two standard deviations. So um, probably that x is bigger than what? Just you could use just just symbols. So bigger than how much? Yeah. Yes. So so we want the probability that um, x is more than so it's we want x the probability that x is bigger than than what? So we want it bigger than the mean and then what with the standard deviation? The mean. Yes. Yeah, so, yep. So we want probably that x is bigger than the mean, which is one over lambda, um, plus two times the standard deviation, which is um, you can put the square root of one over the vari of the of the variance. So we want probably that x is more than the mean plus two standard deviations. Sorry, that was a poorly worded question. Um, so again. For an exponential, the mean is equal to the standard deviation, so um, we want to see if x is bigger than 2.725 plus 2 times 2.725, uh, which is the probability that x is bigger than 8.175. Again, that's just the probability that x, that 1 minus the probability that x is less than that value, so uh, 1 minus the CDF, so 1 minus e to the negative um, lambda, which is 0.367 times 8.175. If you work all that out, the ones cancel. And this is just uh, 0 0.05. And okay with everybody? So finally, say that again. Is it a coincidence that the mean and the? Yeah. So again, the the variance is one over lambda squared. So the square root of that is one over lambda. So. So the mean, the mean, and the uh, <clears throat> the mean and the standard deviation are going to be the same for an exponential. Yeah, <clears throat> it's kind of that, kind of like the Poisson, where the mean and variance are the same same thing. It's kind of a strange property. Here, it's close to that. Uh, the mean and the standard deviation are going to be the same. Okay, and lastly, we can kind of think about a similar question as we've looked at before. So how many hours would the 90th percentile of rain, uh, so what, how many hours would it be for the 90th percentile of rainfall duration? Um, so I want to find a value of x such that um, the probability that x is less than or equal to that value is equal to, is equal to what? <clears throat> for the 90th percentile, everybody said 0.9. <clears throat> so I want to find the value of x such that the CDF equals equals that. So the CDF again is one minus e to the negative lambda, 0.367x. Uh, so I need I need uh, e to the negative 0.367x to be equal to one minus 0 0.9, which is 0.1. And now I take the take the natural log of both sides here. So um, 0.367 
x is going to equal the natural log of 0.1. which means that um, x is going to equal the natural log of 0.1 divided by negative 0.367 uh, which is uh, 6.27 hours. So the 90th percentile comes in there at 6 hours. And actually, uh, in general, we can we can write something down here in general. Um, the the p the 100 times pth percentile. So um, is again we're using remember eta of p, and here that is um, the negative natural log of one minus p. Divided by divided by lambda. So that's something we can say in general. So for any value between of p between zero and one, uh, the percentile I can I can give you a general form there. So for a general exponential distribution, this is this is a a fact. And you could think about doing the same solving the same thing that we did with general p and lambda and we'll give you the same that that's how we would get get there <clears throat> okay any any questions or comments you guys can think of on this example okay well one more one more gamma distribution to talk about so the gamma was our general case we have the exponential which is a special case alpha equals 1 beta equals 1 over lambda um, the chi-square distribution is another another very commonly used distribution in statistics. Anybody heard of the, the chi-square distribution? Yeah, if you've had a statistics class before, I would almost guarantee that you've you've heard of this before. Um, and uh, and this is so again this special case of the gamma when when alpha equals uh, nu over two and beta equals two. So again, this this thing kind of looks like a v, but it's a it's a nu, which is Oh, another a sort of maybe lesser known Greek Greek letter there, <clears throat> um, and then yeah, so this is this is uh, important because we'll use this distribution much more in the future. So won't say a whole lot about it right now, other than uh, the fact that it is a special case here of the gamma distribution. So again, showing you the PDF here um, looks the same as the gamma. PDF, we're just throwing in beta equals 2 and alpha equals nu over 2. Uh, so again, we're still looking at only, only positive values of x here. And, uh, and this parameter actually has a special name. It's called the, the number of degrees of freedom, so, or, or df, degrees of freedom of x. Um, and we'll say a lot more about why, why we use that terminology um, later in this course when we see this again. And then our notation is uh, slightly different. We're going to have x is distributed as a chi-squared uh, random variable with degrees of freedom nu. So this thing, of course, is this is the the Greek letter chi. Looks kind of like an x again. I'll try to make that clear that it's a chi and not not an x. <clears throat> so anyway, that that's what our that's what our notation was going to be. Uh, so. Again, the next, you can guess the next thing we're going to say is what the mean and variance are. Uh, mean and variance are just nu and two times, two times nu. So again, remember, um, if x, if x is distributed as a chi-squared random variable with um, parameter mu, that's the same as saying x is distributed as a gamma random variable with alpha equal nu over two and beta equals 2. So you can see there how the the mean and the variance fall out from formulas that we've looked at before. So we won't, won't go through that whole whole thing one more time. Um, yeah. So um, I wanted to do a, 
a quick example before I let you out of here. Uh, this, this does actually bring us to the end of chapter four. Um, so we're, we started to move a little more quickly than I thought we would. But I wanted to do one more example of, of looking at the uh, that at a gamma distribution here um, before I before I set you loose today. And uh, so this this doesn't quite apply because um, because if you think about it, the quantity is is going to be uh, is not a continuous quantity. But this was a funny example I thought from class on Friday, so I wanted to use. So we can pretend that my random variable here is a continuous one. Um, so we're going to suppose that the number of t-shirts that students in STAT 3470 own can follow a, a chi-square distribution with mean 10. So pretend that you can own fractions of a t-shirt. <laughs> it doesn't quite apply. Um, but anyway, let's, let's say that's the case. And um, has a chi-square distribution with mean 10, so that means our, our PDF here looks, looks something like that. So this is not included in your notes. Just wanted to do one more example here for you. Um, so again, x is distributed as a chi-square um, distribution, but such that its mean is equal to 10. So what does that put my degrees of freedom at? My degrees of freedom, if my effective value is 10, then what are my degrees of freedom? Also 10, right? Yep, so the mean is just equal to that. Um, number of degrees of freedom there. The new, this is my parameter new. <clears throat> okay, um, but I could also write here, I could also write that x is distributed as a gamma random variable, right? Um, alpha is equal to nu divided by 2, so 10 over 2, and beta is equal to 2, or uh, gamma Five, five, two. So, I could I could say that say that as well. That would be equally good. <clears throat> okay, so let's answer a few a few questions here about about this one. Um, what is the probability that a randomly selected student from this class has a number of shirts within one standard deviation of the mean? Um, so again, what I want is uh, the probability that x is between within one standard deviation of the mean. So I have, again, mu minus a standard deviation and mu plus a standard deviation, just kind of using our general, general terminology here. So again, mean of the chi-square distribution is just, uh, so again, remember that the mean here is the number of degrees of freedom and the standard deviation is this is the square root of the variance so the standard deviation of x is the square root of the variance which is 2 2 times nu so this probability one we, we want is actually um, probably that x is between 10 minus square root of 20 and x is between uh, is less than or equal to 10 plus square root of 20. So kind of nothing nothing new yet. So we didn't we didn't talk about okay and so then this is um again this is probably that x is less than uh, 10 plus the square root of 20. That's probably that x is less than or equal to 10 minus the square root of 20. So I didn't I didn't put up here the CDF for the chi-squared distribution, but um, any ideas on how I could how I could find those things? So yes, yeah, so I could I could find the area absolutely. So 10 minus square root of 20 is about, about somewhere between here and here. So I could actually calculate that integral. Um, which would involve taking an integration over over this nasty thing. So I'd rather not do that. So again, remember the chi-square distribution is a special case of what? The gamma. So how do we do it for the gamma? We can do the same thing. We can do the same thing here. Um, so yes, the, that's that's exactly right. We to find that exactly, we could do an integral over that PDF. But to um, 
give ourselves a shortcut here. Uh, we're going to do the same thing as we did before. Um, so this is just the incomplete gamma function. So f of um, x divided by alpha. Um, well, let me. I'm running out of space here. Let me just say this is equal to about 14 point. Um, four seven uh, minus the probability that x is less than or equal to um, five point five three. And then uh, I want to talk about one more the one more part of this. So I'm going to skip over this this calculation here, but you could use the same strategy as you used before to find what that what that probability is going to be. Uh, the, yes, the answer, thank you, is about, is approximately equal to um, 0.774. And I did that using some rounding from the, uh, again, I don't have integer values there, so I just approximated that thing. Well, I guess that's as far as we'll get through this example. Um, I'll put up some, I'll, I'll finish out the slides for this example and post them on Carmen. Um, Thank you guys for being here. Uh, maybe we'll see you later on today. Have a great, have a great Monday.